Oh my God, with such an introduction, I am, I don't know what to do, believe me. First of all, I have to tell you something. I keep looking at uh, uh, the topic itself of the conference, and I just learned this morning that Mark keeps on adding things to the, to the main topic. Originally, uh, it was only uh, uh, future of national branding and tourism, then it became Sustainable tourism, which is all right, and international investment. Now, this morning, I realized that he's talking about future of global politics. So, my goodness gracious, this is going to be quite a salad. Anyway, unfortunately, since I, uh, I also learned this morning that I was supposed to come and talk to you guys this afternoon, I didn't have time to listen to everybody this morning, so I rushed back to the hotel and um, write a few things. It's, it's kind of hard to... Uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's kind of hard to... Uh, uh, come and talk about the same thing when uh, everybody has the same task or assignment. So you could become repetitive. That's why I did not prepare any PowerPoint or anything like that. So let's see how it goes. Is there a future for national branding? Or is it already here just because Simon Anhold said it? Is it really necessary to attract tourism until your investment? What kind of investment? Is the investment that we need in, in, in the developing countries? Or is it the type of investment that China is doing in the United States, buying billions of billions of treasury bills and uh, bonds. It's a different investment. Is it really a key element to export our goods? I mean, we're talking in this particular case about, you know, small countries. I'm not talking about Germany, because everybody knows that, you know, Germany builds uh, Mercedes-Benz and BMWs, and so if, if it is made in Germany, it must be good, because the Mercedes are one heck of a car, aren't they? Now, what face do you present to the world? And I ask you the following question. How do I look? Do I look all right? Yeah, good. Who said that? <laughs> what I'm saying is, do I look all right for this particular event? Am I well dressed, properly dressed? Would you like to be my friend? Mm-hmm, just laugh. <laughs> My point is the following. Yeah, I am to you an image now. But you don't know whether I beat the hell out of my wife, if I am alcoholic, if I abuse my kids, physically speaking, obviously. So it's not only image. You have to know the reputation. See, nations don't brand themselves. It is public opinion that brands nations, don't they? It, it is the public opinion. I mean, based on, on what? Based on the fact that, first of all, you may have an image of a nation, but then again, you have to go deeper and find out about their people, their education, their endeavors, their looks, their temper. Because otherwise, the images sometimes are very misleading. The country's perception, either good or bad, makes no difference, is very much associated with its economic development. A country with a more developed economy has a better perception internationally than a country with a less developed economy. Right? I mean, Germany and Honduras, come on, give me a break. Obviously. Now, talking about economic development, 
an international conference on the future of global politics. What is he talking about, about when he says politics? Or is it policies? Are we talking about, you know, economic policy, monetary policies, development policies, education policies? It, it's, it's a different thing. Obviously, for our countries, our small countries, and not only small countries, all of us uh, accept that there are three pillars of economic development. Inbound investment, exports, and tourism, especially in small economies. And I'll give you examples a little, while, a little later. All three have to do with the country's relationship with the rest of the world. And those relationships are related or hinge on image and reputation. Obviously, there's competition for luring investment and tourism and boost exports. Nations compete among themselves. Back in the year 2003, when I was the Minister of Industry and Commerce in Honduras and we were negotiating with the United States, the free trade agreement, you know, people in Honduras, some people, uh, this is a faction, kept saying, listen, are you crazy? How do you think you're going to compete with the U.S.? That's a power. They will bury you. That's what Khrushchev used to say. And I said, well, wait a minute. I'm not competing with the United States. Who says that? <coughs> I am competing with my neighbors, with El Salvador, with Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica. Are you kidding me? They said, I mean, just in the agricultural sector, the United States is, is, is a giant, it's huge. And on top of it, they subsidize the agriculture. And I said, great, fantastic. But you know why? Because when I buy from the States, I cannot produce. Wheat, I cannot produce. Soybeans, I cannot produce. Yellow corns, I could, but culturally speaking, they decide, you know, people prefer white corn. So fantastic if it is being subsidized because I, I buy the stuff from them. And what I produce here, they cannot produce. You see? Long before the, the free trade agreement with the United States, Honduras, and most of, 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 of probably Central America, we have had a positive agricultural balance of trade. And people don't understand that. But then again, we export cultivated shrimp, cantaloupes, uh, watermelons, oriental vegetables, uh, uh, tilapia fish, which is a, 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 a grown cultivated fish. Just Honduras exports <coughs> around 120,000 pounds daily of fresh uh, fillet uh, tilapia by plane. Okay? So we are competing in Central America for our exports, for investment. Obviously, we need investment. Why? Because without investment from the private sector, they cannot be, there cannot be economic growth. Without economic growth, there will be no employment, and we need to create employment. Most of you, if are not aware, will be aware very soon. But at this point in time, as we speak here, there are 80 million young professionals without any jobs whatsoever, and without not much of a future. It's been said that this could be the lost generation, just as we had the lost decade in, in terms of economic growth in Latin America in the 80s. Now, we have to compete. We understand that when he's talking about tourism, when James Wolfenson was the president of the World Bank, he said the following. If we want to be committed to reduce poverty, we have to get into tourism, for obvious reasons. On the other hand, Someone also said 
the economy of the 21st century will be driven by three super, sec super service sectors, telecom, IT, and travel and tourism. So travel and tourism is, is, a, is a globalized sector. Telecom, <laughs> what can we say about it? Now, countries compete among themselves. Michael Porter, the guru from University of Harvard on competitiveness, he wrote this book, The Competitive Advantage of Nations. There is competition among the countries, however, to come ahead, a given country has to be competitive. And Michael says the following. My theory highlights and reinforces the importance of differences in nations and of differences in national character. In truth, national differences are at the heart of competitive success. Which means that branding is becoming a key competitive asset. Just let me read you something real quick like. September last year, some 25,000 visitors converged in Singapore for the annual meeting of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund and related activities. <coughs> the government spent approximately $100 million, not including the labor cost of all the public sector employees involved. On the preparations for meetings, which ranged from heightened security measures to wiping down railings, railings and planting flowers. About 2,000 volunteers pitched in, and private sponsorship contributed $30 million to the funding. Economic returns were estimated at $110 million in contracts and business opportunities for companies there. $50 million revenues in tourism and retail receipts, and $10 million in spending by financial institutions organizing events. But the main argument put forward was that the real payoff was more intangible. Branding Singapore. Some people have tried to put a value on a, on a particular brand. According to uh, Simon Anhol, He's attempted to calculate these things, and he believes that the Singapore brand, it's $106 billion, or 100% of the 2004 GDP, 25th out of 32 countries. Mind you, by the way, I'm talking billions here. I don't know if these are gringo billions or European billions. See, gringo billions only got nine zeros, and European billions got 12. Anyway, so by this, what I'm saying is that image and reputations are becoming essential parts of the state strategy. So one needs to focus on developing a strategy that is aimed at creating an economic and social development plan. Now, the role of the media and the technology in shaping a country's international image has grown out of proportion. The media. We have been exposed, you know, daily to all the social upheaval taking place in North Africa, right? If you were to, if I were to ask you, what, how would you brand Egypt at this point in time? And probably you would say, well, it's a country hungry for democracy and freedom or liberty. Uh, they got rid of Mubarak without firing one shot. I mean, he fired to them a few, but then he gave there was no response. Now, is this bad or is this good? Would you go as tourists to Egypt right now? No? Well, but you see, this is funny. <coughs> Price cuts up to 50% and the chance of a ringside seat of history, yep. U.S. tourists are beginning to trickle back to Egypt. And while there is no word from talk show queen Oprah Winfrey on whether she would accept the offer, 
The country's freshly installed Ministry of Tourism has reportedly invited Winfrey and other celebrities to organize show, shows from Cairo's Tahir Square. So this guy is, is, is seeing here an opportunity based or leaning on a crisis that has just taken place. And because all of you have been watching and following the events, either you want to go and see by yourself or you want to stay home. You see, he is, is something which is, is doing something that really marzled myself. Projection. New Zealand's tourism received a significant boost from having its striking landscape appear in the Lord of the Rings trilogy of, uh, of, of the films. Now, if we're going to talk about tourism, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't listen this morning. I wasn't here when the Mexican uh, gentleman talked about Mexico. Mexico, Mexico hired a company called Ivope Inteligencia from Brazil. It's a 69-year-old company. And they conducted a survey in the United States last year, around September. What country, well, this, those questions were asked to people regarding the BRIC countries, all right? What country do you believe that is an attractive country for foreign investment? 62% India, 57 China, 50 Brazil, 15 Russia, 13 Mexico. What country do you think is an emerging market? China, 76%, India, 65%, Brazil, 47 Russia, 19 Mexico, 11 We must remember, Mexico is, is next to the States, right? And you, 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 you should bear in mind the fact that 90% of the tourists coming to Mexico from the States, come from the States, I'm from Canada. What country do you think will be an economic power in 10 years? China, 91%. India, 50 Brazil, 26 Russia, 18 Mexico, 4 What country do you think is a true democracy? India, 65%. Brazil, 55 Mexico, 38 Russia, 2 China, 1 what country do you think is a potential threat to the world peace? China, 86%, Russia, 69%, Mexico, 18%, India, 12%, Brazil, 4 What country do you think has too much corruption? Mexico, 92 <laughs> Russia, 76 China, 51 Brazil, 31 India, 24 Basically, this is based on the fact that people listen to the news, watch television, read newspapers, and all these uh, this facts. What country do you think is too violent? 91% Mexico, Russia 37, China 29, Brazil 22, India 12. What country do you think is a great vacation destination? Brazil 77. Mexico 46, India 18, China 16, Russia 15. What country, what is the country that you personally would like to visit? Come on. <laughs> Brazil 68, Russia 46, China 41, India 40, Mexico 32. So, President Calderon obviously was impacted on this. So immediately he put together a good team of, of, of knowledgeable uh, advisors and, and executives from the Ministry of Tourism, and they put together a, 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 a very aggressive plan. Even Taleb Rafai was there, uh, it must have been a week ago or so, the Secretary General of, of WTO. And uh, he said, uh, Mexican Presidente Felipe Calderón Monde signed a pact with the leaders of its tourism industry to try to push the troubled country to become the world's number five tourist destination by 2018. Becoming number five could generate, listen to this, more than four million direct jobs, perhaps three million more indirect jobs, and increase uh, foreign currency income to $40 billion. He said that while Mexico has 
real and perceived problems such as drug cartel violence that has killed more than 34,000 people in the last four years and has spilled over to some tourist mechas such as Acapulco and Mazatlán. He says the country has still welcomed 22 million and a half visitors last year. So what I'm saying here is that, first of all, obviously, the future of branding is here. And it's not by choice. It's because we have no choice. And we have no choice precisely because we get all these images of, of, of actions, activities, things that are taking place in Mexico, in China, in India, in the United States, in Wisconsin, in Madison, Wisconsin. And then it's, it's for us to make up our minds. Is that a good country? Is that a bad country? Do I look good today? Yes, but you don't know me. You, you don't know whether I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic or not. You see? So we have to go deeper. And the different governments have to really hire professionals on this particular matter and be able to manage. You have to manage your brand. You have to be able to do it properly. But then again, don't try to change the image of your country or to rebrand your country overnight. It will take from 10 to 20 years. Is it going to be too late? Get the heck out of me. But anyway, let's still be there and keep on trying. In the meantime, let's have a break. And I'll drink to that. And I'll rest my case. <laughs> it's up to you. Either questions or a break. No, no, I think we certainly have time for some <laughs> questions and some comments. Uh, we're, we're doing okay with the time. Please, uh, and as always, if you could stand up and introduce yourself before you ask your question or comments. I see one on the front row. I knew we were going to ask. Uh, I've asked questions so far every time. A uh, quick one. Um, remittances from migrant workers in the U.S., are they good for Latin America or bad? You know, it's a good question. By the way, let me tell you something which I've, I've, I had in my notes. Do you know that Honduras happens to be the second most globalized country in Latin America? Number one is Panama. You have any idea why? It's a combination of a lot of things. First of all, just look at Honduras, tiny Honduras. Our main market is the United States. The second market is Central America itself. The third is Europe. So we sell abroad. But we have to import from abroad as well. Raw materials or, or soybeans or wheat. Our loans come from abroad, either from the World Bank, from the Inter-American Development Bank, from the IMF, or from friendly governments. Our donations come from abroad. Our tourists come from abroad. The family remittances come from the United States mainly. In fact, there was a point in time that they represented like 20 or 22 percent of the GDP of Honduras. That means being globalized, believe me. Now, your question, is it good or is it bad? Well, that's a tricky question because it is good for the economy. It is bad because what it reflects is the fact that we are not able to create enough jobs to maintain our people there in Honduras. El Salvador has 2 million.4 Salvadorans in, in the States. Honduras has 1 million. Just because of those two uh, Salvadorans and Hondurans, those two countries have a demand, a market for what we call nostalgic products, the frijoles and the platanos and the mantequilla and the stuff like that, you know. And believe me, it's, it's one heck of a... Uh, the, the amount of money that, that, that we, we, uh, we export to the States, we, uh, Honduras and El Salvador, uh, in nostalgic products. But then again, no good because, you know, we are not able to create jobs, enough jobs. And so they have to migrate 
And uh, here in Europe and in Spain, we have at this point in time Honduras, something like 37 or 36,000 Hondurans. Ecuador is, is the leading, and the Colombians are the most uh, numerous uh, 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 diaspora. Anyone else before we go to coffee? Yeah, so another hand in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Ambassador, uh, it's uh, really nice to, talk to, to have the opportunity to talk to you, so thank you for coming. And I would like to ask you uh, two different things. Uh, one would be uh, a political question about, about your country. Uh, we know that you have taken office in September so uh, in Madrid uh, as Ambassador, so uh, we can still say that uh, you are at the beginning of your mission. I would like to ask you what are your, let's say, priorities or, or foreign policy goals uh, in Madrid uh, of your mission, considering also the foreign policy of your government? Especially in the, let's say, concerning the country's image after the uh, the crisis or turbulences in 2009. And the second question would be a follow-up question to what you have presented uh, concerning the survey in the United States about the perception of the Americans towards BRIC countries and Mexico. I would like to ask, uh, ask on Mexico and uh, uh, to go back to to the topic, which is nation branding tourism. What would you advise uh, President Calderon? You have you have said that uh, they they convened a special uh, let's say group of of, of, of people to, to help uh, let's say develop tourism or attract tourists. What would you advise him in, in his current situation? Uh, the very very let's say uh, unfavorable security situation, the drug cartels, the violence, and tourism. How would you combine this? How would you uh, get out of this situation without uh, let's say doing a harm to to tourism in, in Mexico? Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, let me see if I remember. My, my friend from Germany, Alzheimer's, is getting to me. Uh, <coughs> the first question. You may recall that uh, you seem to be pretty well informed at, as to the events of the 20th of June in, in Honduras when President Zelaya was removed. As Minister Walcada keeps saying in Spain, according to my constitution, that was not a coup d'etat. Now, I must admit, the military committed one, one, one sin. Uh, the military were supposed to go and arrest former President Zelaya. But they were not supposed to send him to Costa Rica. That's against the Constitution. That was, a, that was a big pecado mortal. Now, was it a coup or was not a coup d'etat? For the next 25 years, the scholars will debate on this particular issue and there will be no agreement whatsoever. Then again, sometimes you reach a conclusion based on politics as well. How come it took two months to the State Department to decide that it was a coup d'etat? But on the other hand, they never said there was a military coup d'etat. How they said it was a military coup d'etat they had to go to Congress to certify it. And the Republicans were waiting for them like this. Come here, baby. So let's stay away from that issue. Uh, the United States was very valuable during the, uh, uh, those events, and so was Spain. I am in Spain, and my main... There are two, two things, or two main objectives. First of all, try to smooth out if there are any frictions still in a relationship, which they are not. However, Spain maintains that President Zelaya has to return to Honduras. President Lobo has said, listen, you're welcome, man. Now, whether if he comes back to Honduras, we'll have to face uh, the different charges that he's been uh, accused of, that's a different material. On the other hand, since we need, as every, every other small country needs investment, the other thing that we are supposed to do in Spain and everybody everywhere else is to foster investment. Please, Spaniards, come to Honduras and invest. Please come to Central America. When I say please, what I'm saying is, hey, take a look at us. Then you decide. By the way, you know, I always felt a resentment. 
I don't know whether to say from Europe, or Europeans, or just the Spaniards. Because they keep saying, listen, why are you so pro-gringo, pro-American? Well, what, what would be the right answer? Listen, first of all, look at the map, man. It's geography. I'm next to them. Then again, I saw you guys during the conquista, during the colony. I never saw you again. All the gringos have come to Honduras and Central America and the Caribbean to plant bananas hundreds of years ago with the mining. Right now, the United States is the largest investor in Honduras. Is our main market. What we sell to Europe is basically coffee. Probably this year that the prices are very good, we will probably export to Europe a uh, $1,000 million worth of coffee. The bananas, they won't let me. Germans love bananas. Sorry about that, man. I wish I could send you more bananas than I, than I can grow. But basically, it's promote investment, smooth out uh, a relationship, political relationship. Uh, we have to wait and see what's going to happen in the next elections in Spain, whether the Partido Popular will, will win. That will change the whole geopolitical position of Spain as well. Other question? Yes. <laughs> Final question. Hi, I'm Mary from um, Nigeria. I'm currently studying international tourism and at the Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. I, during your talk, you talked about um, image and reputation as two elements that help in nation branding. And um, you also talked about um, developing countries um, not having so much acceptance, um, maybe by tourists coming in. Now, I'd like to know, if your reputation as a country and your image, it's um, not good, and um, the tourism sec uh, sector of the country and the nation as a whole is not really um, good, what would you advise um, be done to rebrand the tourism sector? of that developing country because uh, as far as I, I, I have knowledge right now, if um, your image and your reputation is bad, there's no way uh, your tourism sector can develop. Thank you. I forgot to answer you about Presidente Calderon, yes, and which is in the same line of thought. It is, it is, not, it is not so easy, believe me. Uh, in, in, in the Mexican case, for instance, violence is tops. And it's basically due to drugs. If we go back in time, the U.S. designed what it was called at the time El Plan Colombia. Listen, Colombians, I'm going to beat the heck out of you guys, especially to you, you know, uh, drug lords, Kingsmen. I'm going to throw you the atomic bomb, the F-15s, and the whole shaman. They announced this in advance, so they moved to Venezuela, to Central America, and they strengthen their chapters up in Mexico. What has happened now is that the Mexican cartels are much more stronger than the Colombian cartels. In fact, they challenge them. Now, it's such a good business that among the different cartels in Mexico, there is one heck of a fight to control more or less territory. You're talking about the Tijuana cartel, uh, Ciudad Juarez, uh, uh, the Atlantic, which goes from Veracruz to Tamaulipas all the way, the Grupo Zeta, which is a Sinaloa uh, spin-off from Chapo Fernandez. Now, all this violence has also spilled over Central America. Believe me, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, we are very complicated. Now, as the U.S., design the plan Colombia, now they have come up with the plan Merida. Merida is a Mexican city. Okay? Now the plan Merida, because there's too much violence in Mexico, man. And what's that? They're going to give me guns, grenades, helicopters? That's not the answer. In the case of Mexico, I'm going to say something that might not be the right thing to be said. 
But a lot of scholars also claim that if the U.S. legalized, were to legalize the drug, that would be the end of it. Just that it happened with the alcohol in the late 20s or early 30s. In fact, they made money out of it because they taxed the damn thing, right? Now, would that be the same effect when it comes to drugs? I don't know. But in the United States, everybody talks about drugs coming from Mexico or coming right from Colombia and Venezuela uh, through Honduras to Central America and Mexico. But nobody talks about the marijuana business in the United States, which is worth $40 billion, billion with a B, a B is in butter, dollars. Don't believe that in Napa Valley in California, they only grow grapes for wine. It would be a surprise. Okay. So it is difficult to answer your question as well. If you have a bad reputation, will people venture to go there or not? Even with the crime right of Mexico, gringos keep coming down to Mexico. You see, 22 million people. 90% of those guys and gals came from the States and Canada. Now, they say, well, let, let's don't go to Acapulco, let's don't go to Mazaplan, uh, maybe Cancun is still okay. But it's, it's, it's difficult. I don't have an answer to say, well, what should we do in order to clear up our image and our reputation and let the tourism come down here in Cascades. By the way, uh, don't believe the movie, but something is going to happen in December 2012, according to the Mayan calendar. <laughs> the Mayan calendar ends in December 22nd, 2012. And it's been there for the past 3,000 years. Why? Did they decided to end the damn thing on the 22nd of December 2012? I don't know. But in the meantime, I invite you to come to Copan in Honduras. Don't go to Chicago in Guatemala, don't go to Chicago in Mexico. Let's go to Copan, okay? Thank you very much. I'll be seeing you downstairs.